podcast featuring leadership lessons from and conversations with those veterans that have served in the United States Armed Forces. Meet your hosts, Robert Lewis, a proud enlisted veteran that served active duty in the United States Marine Corps, Iraq, and Shalom Klein who is privileged to be an officer in the United States Army Reserve. Hua! They both agree, we all serve. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to yet another episode of the We All Serve podcast. I am your host, Robert Lewis, the Marine, and uh, I'm here with my co-host, uh, my brother, uh, Shalom Klein, the Army guy. That's and right. I am the Army guy. And uh, <laughs> don't you ever forget that, Robert. Good to be back with you, brother. How's your week been? Oh, man. It's been very productive, very busy, uh, but very good. How about yourself? You know, awesome week. Flew by. Gorgeous. Uh, I know both you and I are uh, are in Chicago, and it's been a absolutely gorgeous week. And, um, you know, just honestly... I mean it. Very, very excited to see you uh, for for another chat, um, but of course for our interview today. And it's I can't believe it. Episode number eleven. These uh, these conversations have flown by. Feedback continues to pour in, and I'll just say this real quick, as I always do in the top of every show. If you're just listening to this conversation on your favorite podcast platform, make sure you click the subscribe button so you don't miss any future discussions on the We All Serve podcast. Um, We've got some great conversations in store. And if you're listening and you're not seeing, you could also go on YouTube and search for We All Serve. And again, um, watch the conversation and click subscribe because, you know, seeing is believing, as they say. That's right. That's right. And same here, brother. I, I, I'm so glad that I can see my brother once again here on the podcast. And um, I, I just want to say that my thoughts and prayers are with uh, what the story that I'm following out of California with the Travis Air Force Base. I know that uh, they've had to evacuate the base because of wildfires there. Um, and so uh, thoughts and prayers are that everyone makes it out safely. Um, I know that's an ongoing thing for the past few days. Um, and so um, this is another reason why we do our podcast. Um, there's always something going on in the world that uh, can distract us from the positive uh, things that are happening. And so uh, our podcast is to make sure that you keep your eyes on the, on the great things of service that are happening all around us. And our guest today certainly uh, has that standard uh, as a part of his life. Wouldn't you say that as the same, Shalom? Absolutely. I've uh, I've I've watched, um, and I mean, both you and I certainly have benefited from the uh, from the tremendous work um, of our guest. Um, I've I'm always in awe. I, I say this um, all the time, but I try to learn something from everybody that I interact with. And uh, you know, sometimes it's 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 easier <laughs> than other times, but I, I I truly believe it that every single conversation it doesn't matter what the interaction might be around, we have the opportunity to learn. And um, that said, also I learn from everybody, even those that I haven't met. But I, I you know I feel very grateful um, that we have the opportunity to uh, to have this conversation with somebody that has dedicated. Um, much of his career to serving those that serve. And as we say on the show, you know, we all serve. So we're all, we're all brothers. We're all partners in, in this and um, certainly looking forward to learning from this conversation. Agreed. And uh, I know as we move forward almost into, uh, well, pretty much election uh, season and uh, a lot of folks are, have their eyes on what's going on in DC um, and our, and are really around the nation with, um, the, the election, the presidential election coming up. Um, our guest today knows a little something about that. Uh, so uh, I'll just get right into it. Our guest today is the ninth United States Secretary of Veterans Affairs and served under President Donald Trump and is the first non-veteran to hold the position in the government's, of the government's second largest, largest agency. Dr. David Shokin received a BA from Hampshire College 
and a medical degree from the Medical College of Pennsylvania, which is now Drexel University. He then did his medical internship at Yale School of Medicine and his residency and fellowship in general medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. He has been described as one of the high priests of patient-centered care. Dr. Shokin was the president and chief executive officer of Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. He also was president of Morristown Medical Center and as vice president of Atlantic Health System Accountable Care Organization. He was the first chief medical officer of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and later at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, Temple University Hospital, and the Medical College of Pennsylvania Hospital. In 2015, Dr. Sh Dr. Shokin left the private sector when he was named by President Barack Obama as Undersecretary of Veterans Affairs for Health in the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. Once when his staff told him it would take 10 months to organize his summit on combat veteran suicides, Dr. Shokin told them that during the wait, 6,000 veterans would die and he needed them to get it done in one month. And they did. On February 13, 2017, the United States Senate unanimously confirmed Dr. Shokin as the U.S. Secretary of Veterans Affairs in a 100 to zero vote making him the only cabinet nominee by President Trump to have a unanimous consent. Dr. Shokin has the Shokin blog and is also an accomplished author with his book titles, Questions Patients Need to Ask, Getting the Best Healthcare Published in, in 2008, and it, should be this hard to, it Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country, our Broken Government and the Plight of Veterans, which was published in 2019. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the We All Serve podcast humbly gives you the ninth Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dr. David Shokin. Hey, good to, good to see you. We've been, we've been having some uh, in these days with the difficulties of, of remote communication. I've been having some trouble, but hopefully this works now for us. So I'm really glad to be with you guys. Absolutely, Dr. Shokin. Mm -hmm. We are just proud to have you uh, on the podcast. Thank you so much. We know you're uh, an incredibly busy uh, man these days and has been for quite some time. And uh, we're just going to jump right in um, sure. as we just, just have conversation on our podcast and, and yeah. see where it goes. So. I understand it, Dr. Shokin, that you were born at uh, Fort Sheridan Army Base in Illinois, and, and then eventually you moved to Pennsylvania. So what was it like growing up in the Pennsylvania area in the 60s and 70s? Well, uh, yeah, listen, you can say I'm sort of born with um, serving in my blood because I was born in Fort Sheridan where my dad was uh, serving. He was a captain in the Army. and um, uh, we moved to Philadelphia, where my mother was from. Of course, my dad felt like uh, better to have her closer to her family. And uh, it was a great place to grow up. Um, you know, relatively, those were the days when you didn't have organized sports after school. You just sort of went outside and played basketball and football with the kids in the neighborhood. And no one worried about letting the kids outside the house at that time you know very carefree time it was a good good place to grow up and uh, i felt fortunate to be there so uh david I, I echo what robert said earlier it's such a pleasure to uh to have you on and thank you for doing this um you you were born on a uh, on a military installation and uh your dad as you mentioned uh at the time was an army captain yeah. um what I, i'm curious what as as a, your you know your family what was your impression of service at the time? Was it just something like you didn't know anything else and you know, you're just surrounded by folks in uniform? Or what, what did you think as a child about, about those in uniform and those that serve? Well, I grew up really, uh, my formative years were during the Vietnam War. And of course, that was a very divisive war and very controversial. And so 
um, you know, you had you had a very different sense of people returning from Vietnam than you certainly do now in the you know more recent conflicts. And so um, I think serving, at, you know, when I grew up, it was a mandatory thing. Everybody just did it. And then it changed, of course, to a volunteer service. And now I think it's the opposite. I think many people grow up and they don't understand what it means to serve. They don't often know people who serve, as you know, better than anybody. Uh, service is often run in families. So so it's it's not unusual to see, you know, large groups of people serving coming out of small communities. But for many people now, they, they don't have the chance to interact with people who serve. And I think that's one of the things that has led to some of the problems that we're seeing even today, that 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 people are isolated from from one another and they don't share a common experience. And one of the reasons why I've called on uh, a national year of service for all people, because I think the experience that I have, and I don't know about both of you, but is that those who have served together and created a bond and have sort of unnaturally in some ways been thrown together, people with different backgrounds and ideas and perspectives, end up coming out of it, understand one another better and having an appreciation that brings us together. And I think that's what we need more of now. And so a national year of service, whether it's in serving in the armed forces or serving in other ways, both domestically and around the world as Americans, I think is going to be one of the things that we really need to come out of where we are as a society. Amen. I completely agree with you, David. And, um, you know, not to, not to get political by any means, but that, I know um, Mayor Pete um, uh, talked about it in his campaign, and I, I admired that uh, greatly. I, I joined later. Robert's experience was different. He, he joined uh, at a young age. I, I only recently joined. I joined at uh, age 29. And um, you know, going through basic training with uh, with with kids that were uh, you know you know younger than younger than I was, and I, I just admire them tremendously. And uh, you know, there as I was saying in our little intro, in our little uh, in our little uh, you know dialogue back and forth, uh, there is something to learn from everybody, and it does change your life. I felt like I might not be able to be changed, but service has changed me already continues to change me each and every day um, by the folks that I'm privileged to serve serve with. Um, so it's tremendous. And hey, listen, I mean, I would love to to, to work with you on, on finding ways. It's as we say on this podcast, it's not it's not about which uniform. Robert and I have this ongoing um, you know beef between the two of us or the branches. Um, but it doesn't right. matter which uniform you put on or even whether you put on a uniform at all, bottom line, step up and serve. And you know, year of volunteering. I spent time in Israel, and I think they call it Sherut Lumi. Um, when when you know, folks, if you can't serve in the military, you volunteer at a hospital. You do something. It changes your life, and you build camaraderie and you build leadership lessons. And that's what it's all about. So, uh, hey, Absolutely. awesome. I agree with you. Absolutely. And, and, and David, thank you for sharing your, your, your childhood and kind of what that was like for you and your dad being an army captain. And he was also a psychiatrist. Yes, and, yes. You, and, I, and I believe you had two grandfathers that served in World yes. War I. Yes. So I, you know, I, can only, I can only imagine if you know, I didn't come from a, a, a family that uh, served in that capacity in the military. But I can only imagine that with a family of service like that, um, that had to rub off on you in some kind of way. Now, I know that you weren't actually uh, a member of the armed forces, but you have dedicated your life uh, to the lives of those who have served in many capacities. So what my question would be, what did your father and grandfather's service experience do for influencing you to take the path that you've taken? Well, I think with my father, my father, uh, you know, taught me all the time what it meant to help deal with people who were struggling with different parts of their lives and understanding that people, particularly with emotional disorders that many people felt had a stigma or, you know, weren't well understood were just as important as uh, some of the physical illnesses that people can see and understand. 
my grandfather, uh, who became the first pharmacist at the Madness of Wisconsin VA and spent his professional career there, was so proud of being at the VA and would talk all the time about the people that he would meet and help take care of and how important it was to give back. I, of course, as a medical student and a resident, spent time in hospitals and you know, just got to meet and spend time and take care of veterans really as part of my training. And I was always grateful for the people that I met and the people who were so kind in helping me understand how to become a better doctor and taught me how to do that. So when I had the opportunity later on in life, uh, when President Obama asked for my help in coming to fix the VA in 2004, it was an easy decision for me. I just knew this was the opportunity for me to give back to, to so many people who had given not only to me, but to the entire country. And uh, that, of course, was just something that I really felt very privileged to have that opportunity to do. No, and I, I, you know what, I thank you for your service again, you know, in both the Obama administration and in the Trump administration. Um, we, the, the nation always uh, looks, looks to people like yourself who does it and does it well. I, I, I really want to say to you as, you know, to our viewers and listeners, you 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 operate in many capacities. So when we had our first conversation, David, I, I was I was a little late calling you because I got the time zone mixed up, and mm -hmm. I you know and I, and I said to you, I said, David, I, I apologize. You're like, are you kidding? I happens to be all the time. <laughs> so when you're busy, you know, it's like yeah. sometimes you life you you get caught up in things and. Um, I just want to tell you, uh, Dr. Shokin, thank you for putting me at ease uh, sure. and, and, uh, and, and just being a great guy on top of all the great service you do. So thank you. Sure. And, and David, I, I, you know, uh, Robert just mentioned, um, obviously, your, your, your service in Veterans Affairs. So you were the Undersecretary for Veterans Affairs during the Obama administration. President yes. Trump appointed you the secretary, and you were unanimously confirmed the only cabinet member to have that status in the administration. You were the first non-veteran to hold that position. So what was that experience like for you, and do you feel that you were accepted by the veteran community by being a civilian? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I, I approached the job that I was doing working for veterans in a completely uh, a political way. I wasn't there because uh, I wanted to have a certain office or to run for office. I was there because I felt it was important to make the VA work better for our veterans. And, um, you know, I just didn't play politics. It wasn't part of who I am and it didn't help me do my job better. So I just approached things by the issues. And I remember uh, right after I left the government and a number of the senators and congressmen held a reception for me. John Tester, who was the ranking Democrat, stood up and said, you know, I've worked with David now for close to five years, and I couldn't tell you today if he was a Democrat or a Republican. And I said, perfect. It's exactly the way it should be, because you can't, once you start politicizing the military or veterans, I think you've completely changed the whole approach that we need to have, which is you serve the country, not because of political party, but because of your love and responsibility as being a citizen. And so that's the way that I approach the job. So getting um, confirmed by the Senate, which actually I was confirmed twice unanimously, once as undersecretary and once as secretary was just the way I felt that it should be. Um, you know, and um, I think not being a veteran what that really caused me to do is to deliberately work much harder to make sure that I was listening to the veterans, that I took the time to really understand what they needed and understood their perspective. And I took that very seriously. My meetings with individual veterans and their families, my meetings with veteran service organizations, I would put on a white coat as um, a doctor and not and go and take care of veterans. And when I did that, I wasn't a secretary, I was just their doctor, but I was listening and trying to learn what the issues were for them to get their problems taken care of. 
And, and I think that was important. Um, I, I will say, I remember the very first, uh, when I was essentially interviewing as undersecretary, I was coming from the private sector and there's a group of people that interview you. There were heads of the veterans of foreign wars and American Legion and members of Congress and various people from VA. And the head of the uh, veterans of foreign war, a guy named Bob Wallace, the executive director, asked me the very first question in the interview. And he said, if you were the undersecretary, which is the person that, that runs the health organization for VA, if you were the undersecretary, who would you be working for? Who would your boss be? And I thought to myself, okay, well, look, I could answer it. It's the president because the president is the one who appoints the undersecretary. Uh, or it could be the secretary because the undersecretary reports to the secretary. Or it could be the American people because the taxpayers are paying it. But the way I answered it was, it's the veterans. That's who I'd be working for. That's that's who the secretary, that's who the undersecretary works for. They work for this country's veterans. And that's why this organization exists. And uh, I remember Bob, Bob Wallace, who asked me the question, said, you know, we've asked that to people all day long, and you're the only one who got that answer right. Because that was clearly his perspective on it too so wow and that's the way it should be i agree with you 100 yeah. percent. i agree as well uh so i would say uh, dr shokin after you know your tenure with uh being the ninth nice secretary of veterans affairs after seeing the agency really from the inside out top down if you will mm -hmm. uh does the military do enough for veterans with mental health care currently, with mental health issues? Uh, well, you know, clear, clearly not. Very, very complex issue, very important issue. In fact, as secretary, I made it the single highest priority of the department um, so that everybody was clear that not only were we not doing enough, but uh, we had to focus on this to do better because with 20 veterans a day taking their life through suicide, um, you know, how could you ever say that you're doing enough? And the problem exists on both the Department of Defense side and on the Department of Veteran Affairs side. And that that interchange when you leave being a service member to when you become a veteran, the highest rate of suicide actually is in that first 12 months when you leave the Department of Vet, uh, when you leave the Department of Defense and you become a veteran. And so there really has to be efforts on both the Department of Defense side and the Department of Veteran Affairs. Just on the Department of Defense side, um, we know that I believe the solution is going to be something that looks like a reverse boot camp. When you join in and, um, you know, you were talking about this earlier, all the training that it takes to become a effective uh, member of the military. It takes the same amount of training on the way out to learn how to become an effective civilian once again and how to be able to deal with these issues. And we simply aren't doing that well enough. So I think putting in a reverse boot camp strategy uh, about six months before you leave the military is important. Once you leave, one of the reasons why I changed the electronic medical record at the Department of Veteran Affairs to be the same medical record as the Department of Defense is because there has to be a good communication between these organizations. When I got to VA, we were seeing vet, we were seeing people who had left the Department of Defense. We didn't know what medications they were on. We didn't know what treatment they had gotten in the military. And unfortunately, people were dying because we just didn't have the right information. So now that we're going to have the same medical record, I think that's going to make a big difference. And we did about six or seven other major things, such as providing same day, same day appointments for uh, people with mental health issues in every VA across the country. Uh, we also uh, expanded our telemental health capabilities to reach more people. We uh, started to use our databases to identify people at risk for uh, behavioral health issues and for suicide and got them help. We really expanded our programs like providing service dogs and doing more adaptive sports. And we began to address issues that were really important like homelessness and 
chronic pain and providing more treatment options for people with behavioral health. So while we were doing a lot, there still is a lot to be done. And by no means can we uh, say that we're doing all that we need to be doing. And David, I, I have to ask, as a as a guy that uh, has a uh, master's in nonprofit management and finishing my my doctorate in educational leadership, um, I, I we talk a lot about stakeholders and boards of directors and things like that. You mentioned earlier, and I, I've been thinking about this. You mentioned the uh, the interview process, sort of that you went through and talking with all of the BSOs and the representatives. So. In your role as secretary, and even I'm sure in many ways your capacity as, as undersecretary, you have a lot of, call it, boards of directors. You have Congress as a whole. You have, um, you have of course, these specific committees, um, but you also have sure. the, the veteran support organizations. What's it, what was, take us behind the scenes. What was it like sort of navigating all of the people? Most importantly, I should add, and I'm sure you're probably going to say this, you know, is obviously veterans come first and they're, they're your ultimate stakeholders. What's it like navigating all those people and all of those opinions? Well, I think, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize the Department of Veteran Affairs is the country's second largest government agency. There's the Department of Defense and then there's VA. VA has over 400,000 employees, a budget of $200 billion. And I think the way that you described it is the way I always talked about the job. There are many, many roles that you have. Not only are you trying to operate and look ahead to have the right policies of such a large agency, but your job is to really be out there trying to communicate about what the organization is trying to do and to listen to try to understand the role and the perspective of the various stakeholders. So you've mentioned the veterans groups. There's no question that's at the top of the pyramid. You've mentioned Congress. So my board was 435 members of Congress, each of which have districts that they represent with different issues as we all see most days on, on TV. Uh, you then had, uh, let's not forget about the employees themselves, 400,000 employees and 40% of them themselves veterans. So very important that one takes them seriously as a stakeholder you then have the press, and I, I took very seriously my responsibility running a large public agency that I was accountable to the press, and I didn't always like the questions that they were asking, but I always felt an obligation to explain what was happening, even if it wasn't good news, and that was an important vehicle. And then last is the executive branch, which is the White House and the president. Uh, it turns out that... Um, you know, for me, the easiest were the veterans because um, they just wanted what the right thing was. They wanted to be uh, represented better. They wanted their services to work better. They wanted the responsibility and the mission of the department to function easier. That I understood. The most challenging of all those groups for me was the executive branch. And, um, you know, working in the chaos that people see every day in Washington is really challenging. And, um, you know, the closer that you get to the White House, the more you get involved in politics. And I've already said I didn't go to Washington for politics. I didn't like that part of it. And it was a very, very complex role to navigate doing the right thing for veterans and also trying to deal with the political influences that were coming out of the White House. And ultimately, as I say, the people who go to serve, uh, you have to understand where your red lines are. You have to understand what your principles are and when you're willing to walk away from your job. And every day you have to put your job on the line to stand up for those principles. And ultimately, uh, I wasn't willing to play politics with veterans and veterans' lives. And ultimately, that's the reason why I left the government. Wow. Thank you for your candor, uh, Dr. Shokin, as well. And I, I guess my you know, just to kind of follow suit to my brother Shalom's question, you know, what, you know, the, the cost of health care for veterans, does it have more of an effect on the type of care veterans receive versus actually caring for veterans needs in your op in your opinion? So does it, the cost have an overarching effect more so than what the veterans actually need for their care? 
Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I'm not sure, Robert. I totally understand the question. Okay. I, I, I will tell you that um, to me, coming from running private hospitals, you know, out in the, out in the civilian sector, uh, I worried a lot about did our, did the money coming in from the insurance companies match the money that it took to take care of our patients in a high quality way in the department of veteran affairs, uh, I didn't worry about that as much. I would go to Congress. I would tell them what we needed to take care of our veterans. And the Congress was extraordinarily supportive of that. Uh, I never really faced a situation where if I said to them, this is what I need to take care of our veterans that they said no. And so, um, I felt that, um, the largest challenge was not in finding the money. And even today, you know, when I hear people say, well, VA only had the money, they could do a better job. Um, money has never, in my view, been the limitation of the VA doing a better job. It's been being able to get rid of the bureaucratic barriers and being able to, uh, you know, find the right type of legislative changes to allow doctors and nurses to care for veterans in the way that they should be cared for. Wow. And, and Dr. Shulkin, you strike me as a, uh, as a visionary, um, certainly coming into the, into the role. Um, you, you, as Robert mentioned in his intro of you, you saw a problem and you, your answer a moment ago really just, uh, just highlighted that you know, you, you're thinking beyond the short-term needs. You're thinking of your your vision and the solutions, and you've done that um, in your time as under secretary, secretary, and um, you certainly left VA uh, a better place than uh, than than the way you found it. And you know, that's the nature of government. Is you, you know, I'm sure you have substantial. Well, I'm guessing you have substantially less stress not getting calls from uh, from uh, the Oval Office and uh, from all of those stakeholders that you mentioned. Um, but you, I, I have a hunch that you haven't sort of left it all behind, that you still have thoughts on, on the care for veterans. So I have to ask, um, Dr. Shulkin, in your perfect world, perfect might be a dream, but where would you like to see healthcare for veterans go in, let's give the number of 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. Look, the VA system has always been plagued with problems. It's been decades of the same problems that have existed. And so if you're going to ever get through those problems, you need to have a clear, consistent vision and you have to have a plan that you stick with all the way through. And the problem that we have in government is, is that we have rotating leaders. People come in, they do something for a couple of years, then the next person comes in and they put in their team and their plan. And by the time they start implementing it, they're gone as well. So I believe that we have a broken governance system. Not only do I think that the VA can't be politicized, not only with its 435 members of Congress trying to each control what they want, but also the White House that tries to politicize it. So I believe the answer is, is that VA should be taken out of the political structure. It should be run uh, much like we do Amtrak, uh, even, this may sound funny, the post office, but but um, it needs to have its own board, not a political board. And what we've seen in the post office recently is the trouble it can get into when you start putting people in charge that don't have any experience and that are political, you know, completely inappropriate. So we need to have a VA that's run by people who know how to run healthcare systems, take it outside the political environment, and then give those leaders a runway in order to implement the vision. So I believe they should be much like the FBI director, five to 10 year terms that are appointed to be able to implement the vision. So I had a clear vision. The reason I wrote my book uh, is I put that vision down on paper. I want future leaders to be able to say, yeah, you know, regardless of who it is and who takes credit for it, there was a plan. There was a foundation that was beginning to reform VA and move it in the right direction. And let's pick that up and let's keep going with it because it was working. And I do give Secretary Wilkie credit for continuing 
many of the plans that we put in place, continuing to focus on suicide, continuing to expand telehealth, continuing to try to modernize some of the way that VA runs so it runs more like the private sector. And I think that we need to continue with this type of plan. It will take years to get done, but it's the right thing to do. Wow. Well, thank you for um, acknowledging as well uh, your uh, uh, successor as well uh, in the position. And um, and I echo the sentiment that Shalom said, you know, I, I believe you left the Veterans Affairs in a better shape than what it was when you picked it up. And um, and it is only my hope as well that it continues to grow and improve. Um, so I here's a little bit more of a down home question for you, Dr. Shokin. Uh, I know that uh, you're a family man. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're used to seeing you on maybe CNN or Fox or one of those channels, you know, discussing the veterans world issues. So what does downtime look like for <laughs> Dr. Shokin? Just David at home. What does that look like? When I when I experience that, I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> I generally have one speed, and I'm not necessarily proud of that. You know, there are people, my wife is an example, who has, she's a doctor, and she has her professional life, and then she can turn it off and, you know, relax and do the things that she enjoys. I've only ever had one speed, and that is, is that, you know, I, I stick at issues until... I feel like they're done. And I think both of you have sort of referred to this. Uh, there's no doubt I have unfinished business that uh, while I appreciate your observation that VA uh, was left in a better place, and I have no doubt that it was due to the hard work of the men and women who worked there, uh, I was not done. And I won't be done until uh, I believe that our veterans are getting the type of care that they need and they deserve. And my view is, is that if anybody should get the very best health care that this country can offer, it should be our veterans. And Robert, you mentioned about mental health. That's just one example. But clearly, with 20 veterans still taking their lives every day, you cannot uh, feel that your work is done. So I will continue to advocate on behalf of veterans as long as I live. And uh, I am always working on things that I can do to be helpful and to advance the state of where we are. Uh, I have to do it now from a different place than from my office in Washington, but um, there's still many, many ways to be helpful and effective in trying to reform uh, you know, this, this system. And frankly, it's not just healthcare I'm talking about. Our benefit system for our veterans is completely backwards. We have a system that I believe is adversarial with the veterans. We make our veterans wait sometimes decades for the services and care that they absolutely need and deserve. And I've been a strong advocate for our Blue Water Navy veterans with Agent Orange uh, that now they've been waiting 50 years. And uh, I'm working very hard with groups on the burn pit issue from 1990 to 91, where our troops were exposed. And yet, if you go to the VA today, to the website, it says right on there, there is no evidence to suggest that burn pits have harmful health consequences. Well, that's just nonsense. And it's not true. And the literature shows studies that have demonstrated the negative health consequences of burn pits. So uh, I'll continue to advocate for that in the fight for veterans and hopefully to change the way that we do benefits so that future veterans uh, coming in know that if they come out needing our help, they're not going to have to fight to get that help. They're just going to be able to get the help that they deserve. Wow. Wow. I, you know, and thank you for touching on all of those topics. Uh, mental health is near and dear to me as uh, a, a mutual friend or colleague. We have uh, David with, uh, uh, Les Meyer at uh, Teatro. We were working on a lot of different uh, things there. I'm an advisor there, and mental health is is something that uh, they're really putting their best foot forward in the technology space. And uh, thank you for acknowledging that. That that was sure. great. Yeah, and uh, thank you for your continued involvement. You you clearly care 
deeply and uh, I can relate to what you said of that one speed of uh, of uh, uh, and, and keep uh, keep that message uh, you know keep keep moving on uh, there's no uh, there's no downtime what's what's personal is professional what's professional right. is personal and so on and uh, by the way uh, I'm gonna shout out my amazing brother-in-law actually brothers-in-law um, yeah, Yehuda is a, a nurse. He's starting, I think, soon as an ER nurse at uh, at the uh, Heinz VA uh, wow. hospital. And Great. then my other brother-in-law is a pre-med, and he's uh, he's going into anesthesiology. And he's uh, he's he's talked, you know, about his dream is to uh, to serve those that serve. So That's yeah, great. there's good people out there. There's good people out there. Absolutely, so I'm proud of them. I'm proud of them. So, David, as we wrap up this conversation, I know that all all of us, all three of us, and really everybody that's listening, you know, anybody that's tuning in, I know we're preaching to the choir over here. We all serve. Everybody, you know, when you take off your uniform, uh, if you if you wore, you know, the the uniform of 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 those that you know in one of the branches, and doesn't matter what branch, no matter what I say to my buddy Robert over here, even even army. <laughs> ha, ha. Hey, Robert, you were jealous when I jumped up the heights last week, okay? Hopefully I was, yes. <laughs> no, you were. No, but uh, bottom line, it is all about service. And David, as you said earlier, you know, it's it's that I'm, I'm the biggest advocate for what you said. And I talk about this all the time, the year of service, and we've got to continue our work together. And I just implore everybody that's listening, whatever age you might be, Whatever, whatever gender, whatever sexual orientation, whatever your professional life is, you serve. You serve, and it, whether it means just paying it forward, doing something positive, that is the way, the best way forward. And we can work together and finding finding ways to to bring our country together. And it it, it is really about service. It really, really is. So, um, David, as we wrap up, um, what's next for you? Um, you you sort of alluded to it a moment ago. You know what what causes do you want to sh- give a shout out to um, that you're involved in in the nonprofit world and and what can we look forward to seeing from you in the future? Well, I think that's what's uh, exciting about the future. I'm not sure exactly, but I'll continue <laughs> to follow the things that are important to me and I'm passionate about. I've recently joined the board of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Uh, and they have a terrific leader in Jeremy Butler, and uh, I'm honored to be able to continue that work. I, I work with um, uh, several other not-for-profits, um, the Foundation for Arts and Healing, which is called the Unlonely Project, dealing with social isolation and mental health issues. Uh, I'm working with the Burn Pit 360 group to be able to work with that. And I work behind the scenes with members of Congress and people in the administration and and various veteran service organizations to continue to advocate for the work that they're doing. So, uh, you know, this is um, uh, this is all really important. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. So I look forward to making contributions in the future. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Shokin, for coming on and letting uh, folks know uh, the, the great guy you are and the human side of David, not just the the one, the right. image that they see on TV or hear about. And um, and thank you again for your service to those who have served. Yes. Thank you thank for you. your your father and your grandfathers, both of them, their service to our country. As uh, we always say, as I always say, that if you have a family member that served, that means you served as well. That's true. So uh, thank you very much for everything you continue to do. Um, I, I would also ask if you want to uh, just mention your books a couple more times in your blog <laughs> so we can get some traffic there as well. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, please feel free to follow me at on Twitter at David Shulkin. Uh, my book is called It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country. And of course, that really has a double meaning. It's really written for veterans. And I believe, as I've said before, that when you serve and you come back and if you need the help and assistance of your government, it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't shouldn't have to go through the hoops and the layers of bureaucracy and you shouldn't have wait times. And so this book is a lot about that issue and how do we fix it. But it's also meant, as Shalom has said many times, that, you know, 
people who serve in government are also doing service to their country. And uh, it is a very tough time to be doing public service. We see public servants, uh, you know, being brought through uh, the ringer uh, just for doing their job and for standing up on what they believe. And I think it's important that we speak out to support those individuals because we need good people in government, particularly in the time of crisis, like what we're in now with the pandemic and economic issues and the issues dealing with racial disparities that we need good people to lead us in government. So, uh, so that's that book. And then uh, I do a lot of writing and that website is shulkinblog.com. Uh, people can go to, I have a piece out from yesterday on burn pits, for example, and uh, you know, certainly want people to get educated on topics like that. Absolutely. And uh, you just got a couple of new uh, Twitter followers, I see. And uh, and I, uh, I I just saw uh, your uh, your post about the burn pit issue. And, right. And yeah, we will amplify that. And again, thank you. Looking forward to continuing to work together with you Absolutely. and um, on, on behalf of uh, of all of these issues. So. Uh, right. So thank you very much. And, um, and you know, absolutely, uh, as we say, we all serve and you certainly have done that. So thank you. And to all of our listeners out there, uh, be sure to visit uh, Dr. Shulkin's website and make sure you click that subscribe button on, on our podcast so you can uh, continue this conversation. Each week we feature folks that have served and leadership lessons learned from service. Um, next week, uh, I know we've got uh, Angel Torres, who's a a uh, retired Navy vet, uh, who I'll give a I'll give a plug for. Uh, he created the first uh, operational Starbucks on board a Navy vessel. Very cool story. Well, that's Entrepreneurship very cool. while in while in while in military. Those those two terms don't always come together, but he has proven it. So excited for that conversation. So don't miss a minute of it, Dr. Shulkin. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thanks to both. Thanks of you. again.